Okay, this is called Mustang Red, and it's not part of anything. <laughs> Did you see that? She just took off with that guy. Lori was too cool to turn around or to give any signs of acknowledgement. We were already in the past. Dust kicked up, bell-bottom jeans dragging. Now me, I've often gone along for the ride, but it was never in a red Mustang convertible. But Lori was different. She had a kid named Christy who we took turns watching while she went off on her adventures. She was much older than me, like probably 20, at least. Tonight, Christy was being taken care of by this guy called Road Cloud. He'd done three years for possession of two joints down in Florida. He still carried a mean jailhouse look, but he was good with kids. Uh, he was a devoted fan of Jesus or Scientology, I don't recall which. <laughs> Now once, Lori made the mistake of telling his friend Frank that he looked like a little boy because he was so cute. That was the only time I ever saw Road Cloud enraged. He kept yelling about, that's my brother, and disrespecting him. Usually he never said much, just smoked his hand rolls, cigarettes, and everyone else's pot. Every now and then he talked about Harley's. Now I don't remember what Christy thought of his outburst. She probably took it in stride. Once I fell asleep on the couch next to her, and she woke me up to tell me my breath stank. She was not a kid to be trifled with. I don't know what became of Road Cloud or Frank or the guy with the red Mustang. Lori returned a day or two later, and last I heard of her, she and her friend Shari were blissed out and dancing for the 14-year-old guru. She always was a very good dancer. This was called Mustangs and Triumphs, because I had a theme. The red Mustang is still on Columbia Street. It sits, the only car on a short ghetto stretch, as solitary and untouched as I am, since we last rounded that corner and noticed it hadn't moved. Must be first generation, I remarked, but men rarely listen to my thoughts about cars. I could add that they really listen to my thoughts about anything, but that wouldn't be strictly true. Selective hearing. They usually get it backwards, but I'm probably talking upside down. Last night, Danny Ray and I stood on Avenue A mourning a friend. His lost tattoos, motorcycles gone forever, too sad to ponder his finality. Moon rotating over sidewalks, why and how irrelevant in the shadow of his family's grief. A late 70s black triumph turned onto 6th Street, momentarily distracting us, igniting memories of growing up on Brooklyn blocks where only cars and candy stores and cigarettes mattered. Yesterday I brought my old Maxim into the shop, again. My mechanics are the only men in my life who see me without makeup. They recognize my voice on the phone. I invite them to my shows. They tell me about their vintage cars as we test drive mine across the Lancy or on the FDR, listening intently for new signs of trouble. The radio's broken, so lots of time to talk about holidays in front yards, subjects I've learned about only in books and movies. There is a car in every one of my stories. There is a man in every one of my stories. I mark time by gasoline prices in engines, models, makes, my eight-cylinder days, and the names of my mechanics. Jocko, Charlie, Vinny, Jeremy, Ryan, Steve. We stand on Avenue A as the triumph turns sweetly. Lives vanish and return. I drive home past the red Mustang waiting more patiently than I do. The only thing that's changed is a pair of gray flip-flops neatly placed beside the driver's door as if he just stepped out for a cup of coffee or a smoke. I find a spot and park and sit and look up at the half moon and don't ask why. Tomorrow will be another beautiful day, perfect for parks and beaches, but I must return to my mechanics. 
Check the engine light, tack down the molding, reset, test drive, reset. Thank you.